Welcome onto the stage, Dr. Shilpa Chitness, Dr. Erwin Montgomery, and our loud crowd member who volunteered to come up here and uh, let Dr. Chitness evaluate her. So thank you. Well, thank you everybody for being here. So um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to talk to Ms. Prinker um, and try to get some history, uh, just try to explore what her initial symptoms were in what was done and what was found and talk about some associated symptoms that go along with Parkinson's disease and we'll talk about treatments and then we'll talk about um, you know non-motor issues and other things. So thank you Ms. Pinker. Oh you're welcome. Nice to see you. See you always, see you always <laughs> in the clinic. Okay so if anybody cannot see me just point out to me because sometimes I'm blocking uh, the exam. So tell me uh, how old are you Ms. Pinker? Sorry to ask. I'm fine. Thank you. How old are you? Oh, how old am I? Oh, right away. Um, <laughs> 67 and uh, 99 one hundredths. That's great. That's great. And are you left-handed or are you right-handed? I'm left-handed. That's my primary. My so more dominant hand, left hand. Yes. But you're probably ambidextrous? I do things with my right hand that, yes, that okay. I can do with my left. Okay. And... Tell me, when were you completely normal and when was the first time that somebody noticed that there was something wrong with you from a neurological standpoint? Well, I think I was the first person to notice myself, uh -huh. and that was uh, in 2014. 14? But what looking month? back, it was probably five years prior to that that I started having symptoms. And what were the symptoms five years prior to that? I had a tremor in my baby finger, and of course I ignored that because you don't really use your baby finger that much. So I just thought it was interesting. And uh, my, my, I kept telling my, my older sister that my face had fallen. And because every time I looked in the mirror, I saw what now is the, the effect. But I just kept thinking that my face had fallen. I should get a lift. <laughs> that, that's interesting that you noticed that. And this is about five years ago. Yes. Right. So at that time, did you do anything about it? Did you tell yeah. your primary doctor? No. No, no, I did not. I, did. I just didn't think it was all that important. I was getting older. My face had fallen. <laughs> so. Right. Okay. So fast forward to 2014. Then what was the symptom that you noticed at that time? My gait. I okay. was becoming very awkward, uh, particularly if I was tired or I'd been sitting for a long time. I noticed that I just didn't move very quickly and that I was awkward. I bounced off things, banged into things. Uh, I was never like that prior to then. And were, were your problems more on the left side? Did you feel like you were dragging your left leg? Left, left, left okay. side, and definitely. were you shuffling? Probably. Okay. <laughs> And what about, what about like your arm swing? Did anybody comment on your arm swing? No, because I wasn't swinging them at all. I would hold my hands. Closer to your chest? Yes. And not swing them. Okay. Yes, and just drive instead of walking. Right. And what, uh, what, about, what was happening to your tremor? Was it getting worse? Was it, it, it was getting, getting more frequent. Uh, it, uh, and it kind of migrated from one baby finger to my hand. So other, fing other yes, fingers other or your fingers. wrist yes. was also involved. Yes. Okay. What about stiffness, not in the joints? What about stiffness in the muscles of your hand or leg? I noticed it when I was driving, that I was no longer driving, the, turning the steering wheel with my arms, but I was turning it with my body. Not particularly safe, but mm. effective. And so all this was some, sometime in 2014? Yes, probably a little bit into 2013 also. Okay. But definitely 2014. But you are not falling? No, never okay. fall. Right. All right. And so, um, what, so this is what made you decide to see a doctor? Well, there were just a combination of things all put together. Uh, my writing had become very small and very difficult. I realized that I go to lectures every Monday, and I used to take notes so that I could remember what I had heard, and I was no longer taking notes, and I realized it was not because I was tired, but because I just couldn't keep up, couldn't write. Couldn't it was just slow with writing. Slow. Mm -hmm. What about your day-to-day -day activities? What about like brushing your teeth, taking a shower, hygiene, 
all of that you know buttons uh, laces at all Did you have problems was with fine but <laughs> but the brushing of the teeth was um i couldn't do that i so i started using electric toothbrush all the time just because it it moved for me yeah okay so any any other things related to motor symptoms not that i recall but i'm sure there were okay so thank you just to summarize so uh, ms brinker perhaps started with her symptoms uh, five years before they were really apparent. And this does happen with a lot of people, especially if the symptoms are not interfering with your day-to-day -day activities, you tend to ignore it and attribute it to things like old age. And then eventually, as slowly the disease progresses, and you start to notice more, uh, not disability, but difficulty in doing the day-to-day -day things that you are able to do, is when you start to think about whether you should see a physician. And that's what happened. Comments on motor symptoms, Dr. Montgomery? Yeah, so um, I think I think your comments about just attributing things to getting older mm -hmm. is is a very very common common uh, issue, uh, one that that um, kind of needs to be discouraged a little bit because I can remember back when I was a resident or a medical student and somebody's memory started to turn bad and or they were slowing down in their movements and they were 80 years old, the young whippersnapper medical student would say, well, that's what you get for being 85 years old, <laughs> you know, as though you had to do something about that. But it's caused us to rethink a lot about what does it mean to be getting older. And getting older, is, is, it may not be normal as you get older to be stooped in your posture. It may not be normal when you get older to start to slow down. So I think one of the big changes that we've seen in medicine in the last uh, 20, 30 years is kind of a, a, a less of a willingness to dismiss things as just being due to being older. So what does that mean now is, I guess I'm starting to get to the point where I'm getting older. Mm -hmm. So what that means for me is that I'm not, I have to be careful that I don't say, well, this is just because I'm getting older. I need to be more, more aggressive in making sure that that's not something going on. And, and we see this a lot in, in Parkinson patients, is that they tend to wait and wait and wait before they seek medical advice. And now that we have the potential for um, slowing the progression of the disease using certain medications, it's just so much more important now to, uh, try, to try to diagnose the disease as early as we can. And, and again, it becomes a problem if we start just to say, well, this is just getting old age. In fact, some of these medications that we talk about using in Parkinson's disease, in Canada, you can get it in the dog food and cat food. And it seems to help the dogs and cats from slowing, slowing down their aging process. So who, who knows what might happen here? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Montgomery. That's good. Okay, so we talked about motor symptoms. Now we're going to talk about some associated symptoms and non-motor symptoms, which are really a part and parcel of the Parkinsonian syndrome and are sometimes ignored uh, un unless, you know, we have knowledge about it. So I'm going to go head to toe and ask you a few things. So tell me, what about your vision? I know you wear glasses, but did you notice your vision was different, blurring, not being able to move your eyes? I hadn't really noticed it except that going downstairs, I found, I kept thinking that my depth perception had changed, but it probably is the, more the eyesight, that it was hard to distinguish um, the depth of the stairs. Right. And did you get your eyes checked at that time? Yes. And, and everything was okay? Everything's fine, yes. But you did notice, she did notice that there was some problems yep. with depth perception. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your sense of smell. How Did you notice that your sense of smell was not as good? No, I really didn't notice it. But when I was diagnosed and they, I did some of the smell tests, um, I could not tell one smell from another. So you were, you were part of the PDBP program and you did yes. the smelling test and that's when yes. you found out that it wasn't good. That's correct. But during your regular day-to-day -day cooking, that wasn't something that you... Didn't understood. bother me. No. Okay. So I didn't okay. notice. Good. Now, tell, tell us your name loud and clear. Mary Lynn Brinker. Okay. What about speech volume? Did anybody remark about low volume that you were asking people to repeat things? I noticed that I was asking people to repeat things. I thought, though, that, or I mean, that they were asking me to repeat things. 
I thought it was just because they weren't paying attention to me. <laughs> I didn't know they were hearing. <laughs> I just thought they were ignoring me. Yeah, but people think that, yes. I never really noticed that there was a problem okay. that way. And uh, part of that is the fact that I'm, excuse me, doctor, I'm getting a little older. Yes. Uh, and my hearing is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> but uh, yes. I have him convinced. <laughs> but what about, but what about your swan? Go ahead. I just didn't notice that yeah. right off. What about swallowing? When you were eating, when you were taking big vitamin capsules, did you feel that your swallowing was not as good as before? Yes, not okay. as good as before. Okay. I, I would, uh, those big calcium pills are a killer. So. And did you do the, did you do LSVT or the Speak Out Parkinson's program? Yes. Okay. And did you notice that that Improvement. improved? So yes. It, what did absolutely. it improve? Swallowing? Yes, definitely. And then people were not asking you to repeat as much? That's and correct. that's when I noticed the difference myself. So when she got better, exactly. is you noticed that yeah. she actually yes. wasn't doing well. Yeah. Okay, very good. Now what about, let's talk about uh, your bowel movements. Regularity, you know, constipation. Did you have any of those problems? A little bit. Uh, not, not as much. I didn't consider it a problem. I just drank more water, ate more bran flakes. But there was a difference? But there was a difference, okay. yes. What about long history of constipation? Like, no. go, go back 10 or 20 years ago, did you have any problems no, with constipation? No, never. Not at all. When you stand up, do you ever feel like I'm, I feel lightheaded or dizzy? I feel like no. I'm a little never. boozy. You don't feel that. No. And do you have high blood pressure? I have very low blood pressure. You have low blood pressure. Yes. You haven't ever taken medication for no. hypertension? No. Okay. All right. What about urinary problems? Again, people attribute that to getting older. So frequency, urgency, or, you know, peeping on yourself without realizing it. Not in the daytime, but at nighttime, definitely more urgency and okay. more frequency. Okay. So Three you have four like... Four times a night. Yeah. So this is what is called nocturnal poly. Poly is a lot mm -hmm. urea. So that's something that we see in patients with Parkinson's. Okay. Uh, did you see a urologist or did you? No, no, I just got up and went back to sleep. <laughs> okay. Okay, so coming to sleep, what time would you normally go to sleep? Oh, 10, 30, 11. Okay. How long does it take for you to fall asleep? Oh, not more than five minutes. Okay. And then do you stay asleep? I know you no. wake up a number of times to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'll also just wake up spontaneously and, okay. th and think what time is it. And but you're able to away. go back and, and sleep? Sometimes, sometimes not. Okay. So, sometimes I have to. Has, has anybody told you that when you're sleeping, you're snoring, or you stop breathing? Cue the response. Uh, well, <laughs> no, no. I've, I've never seen any apnea. Nothing like that. Okay. Does she um, snore? Yes. When she snores, it's, it's like a cat purring. That's yeah. what I tell but her. I still it's, make it's noise. Not, yeah. but, but she doesn't stop breathing. Ever. Oh, no. I've never no. seen that. No. What about any verbalizing like speaking or what about acting out dreams punching trying to knock the dog off or the lamp no I run. The... i've got this one i run <laughs> <laughs> and she does run yeah and she does act out uh and uh, she will gesture with her hands i talk uh, and she does talk but my uh, legs will go many times she'll be talking running. with her grandkids and but she's asleep but she is asleep right. and and I'll, I'll let it go to whatever degree that it can. If it looks like it's going to go to the dark side, <laughs> I'll kind of wake her up a little bit. What about and injury? Has she caused you any injury during this time? <laughs> that's that, you know, that's the I time refuse to answer on the ground. No, that, I have uh, not no. injured you. I've no. never tried she, to hurt She you. has not, no. no. Okay, all right. And then when you're trying to get to bed, do you feel that your legs feel that they need to move all the time? Sometimes, or, you know, yeah, I have that Will, you, will you get up and stomp your legs and then... Walk, walk around asleep. for a while and then go try and go back. It usually alleviates after a while. Yeah. So sleep disorders are part and parcel of Parkinson's disease. I asked about restless legs, which is this irresistible desire to move the legs. Uh, apnea, sleep apnea can be part of it. Uh, nightmares, as well as you know, dream enactment, which is uh, there's a stage of sleep that's called rapid eye movement or REM. And so REM behavioral disorder is something that's very common in patients with, with mm. Parkinson's. What about this? Let me ask a question. Uh, is, is it not true that when um, a, a Parkinson's patient is in REM, that that's when they be manufacturing L-DOPA? Uh, do, do they want to stay in REM? Uh, 
would it be appropriate then to disturb someone if you think they're in that state? Right. So <clears throat> there's no. There's probably not any change in dopamine production through the different stages of sleep. So that that's probably not an issue. The other issue is you need REM sleep, and in fact, um, one of the types of torture that's prohibited by the Geneva Convention is not letting people sleep, which means not letting them get REM sleep. And there have been actually studies of uh, so-called college volunteers, you know, when you're in college, you <laughs> are volunteers, uh, where they actually um, stopped people from REM sleep and they became psychotic. So it's very, very important that people have REM sleep. And one of the problems, one good. of the big problems with sleep <laughs> apnea is that the sleep apnea is most likely to occur when you're going into REM sleep. So sleep apnea has a huge impact on, on REM sleep, which can be a serious issue. And the other important thing is, as you'd mentioned in talking about the sleep, a lot of people think that, you know, if you don't snore, you don't have sleep apnea. And that's not true. And sleep apnea is very, very common. So I, in my practice, if I even have the slightest suspicion that somebody may be having sleep apnea, we uh, do tests for it. And now the tests are very easy. You can take the machinery home and, and be tested for sleep apnea. So I, I encourage uh, physicians to consider that uh, when they're talking um, um, to patients and they get any kind of suggestion that there's a sleep disturbance. Would you agree then that if you think that, uh, for example, a Parkinson patient is in REM and they may be a little agitated or active, just yeah. let it fly? Usually, you know, I, I usually only treat that when the bed partner complains. Mm -hmm. You know, the one who's getting kicked and poked and yelled at. Not that's complaining. A, that's yes. a signal. To, but generally, it doesn't, doesn't affect the patient too terribly much. But having said that, there are very effective ways for treating REM, what we call REM behavioral <coughs> disorder in patients with Parkinson's disease. So there are very effective ways, ways to manage that. But, but again, the key is um, the sleep apnea issue. And it's really important to manage these sleep issues also because they manifest during the daytime. So people get, if you haven't slept well through the night, then you have excessive daytime sleepiness that can interfere with your work, can interfere with driving. So it's really important to identify these sleep-related issues as well. Okay, very good. What about anxiety and depression? No. no problem, None of that. No. Have you ever had a long history in the past of anxiety or depression? No. Not no, at all. Okay. No. And no strong family history of that? We have a fairly strong history on my mother's side. And that's depression? Yes. But, but you don't have it? I don't, no. Yeah. And you, you feel pretty motivated to get out and do things? Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm busy. Yeah. Okay, all right. Cognitively, how are you doing? How's your, you know, um, <laughs> who, do, do you manage your own finances? Yes. Or somebody does yes. it for you? No, I, I'm, well, I don't do my own taxes. Right. I assemble, but I ship it off to the okay. accountant. And you've not had any problems with? Checks or missed checks? No, no, no. What about when you drive? Do you get lost while driving? No. Okay. Okay. So, what are the important things? Thank you. And um, what about uh, skin cancer? Any history of skin cancer? No history of skin cancer. And you, do you see a dermatologist regularly? Once a year for yeah. a check. Yeah. For melanoma. Yes. That. Okay. What about? Uh, let's talk about your treatment. So, at what point when you were first seen? Um, what did the doctor do for you? Did they get any labs? Did they get any tests? What What was the process? Yes, I had a um, DAT. And that was procedure. that was for you had a DAT scan before you went to see the neurologist. No, that was after. After. Okay. Yes. Okay. And and I I was part of a study, so I had a lot of blood taken, a lot of tests done. But I'm not sure whether that was part of the study or part of the. Diagnosis. Right. So, Ms. Pinker is talking about this initiative. It's called uh, PDBP or Parkinson's Disease Biomarker Project. Our site is one of the sites for that. It's through NIH. And we are looking for, uh, you know, we're looking for different things. So, we're looking for either chemicals in the blood or CSF, but we were also looking for clinical markers. So, we check, you know, we do a cognitive assessment test, we do a good smell test. Um, you know, we'll do a, we have a very fancy gate lab that, that, that checks things. And we're longitudinally following this patient since 
about 2012, uh, our study ends 2017. So we'll analyze the data and see whether we are able to find something that would predict the progression of, of Parkinson's. And as Dr. Montgomery said, it's very critical to be able to diagnose somebody early and get them started on exercise and on some of the medications. So, so what medication were you offered at that time? Um, the levodopa. And did you did you discuss about the different app options that were previ probably available for you at that time? Uh, yes, I probably don't remember much of that. I was in okay. kind of shock. <laughs> so, yeah. but yes, it, it was discussed. I also take um, and was prescribed initially Azalec. Uh huh. Um, so I have those two. And patients. what did Azalec do for you? Did it help you? Yeah, did it you did see? help. It did help. I I noticed a, a, a difference. I wouldn't say it was. 100% effective, but it definitely... What was better? What symptoms were better? I could walk straight. You could walk straight? Okay. Yes, and That's the true. tremor in my finger was no longer uh, an issue. Go ahead. And her, her sleep was much more peaceful. Sleep was much more peaceful. And has been. And, and they've, you know, you know, worked with the medication and tweaked it, and it continues to get better. Right, so she was prescribed a medicine called Rosagilin or Azelet, which is in the category of... Uh, MAOB inhibitors, and Ms. Brinker tells us that she improved, her walking improved, the tremor in her finger improved, and she was able to sleep peacefully. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you the medication was not enough for you. Right. It did not give you enough improvement uh, for the day-to-day -day activities that you required. Correct. Right? And what were those activities that you felt like, I really need more medication? Well, driving. Um slowness of movement. I was just taking so long to get dressed and up and out the door in the mornings. And okay. It so did you, help. So there was an oral progression, slow, but progression mm -hmm. of your disease yes. that, that required. And so at that time, you talked to your doctor and decided that the best medication for you was levodopa, carbidopa? Correct. Right. And how much medicine were you given? Was it a low dose? Very low dose, I right. believe. I, mean, I don't know what the dosages was are. Was it a quarter tablet, half tablet? Um, half tablet. Right. And you took it how many times a day? Started out with a quarter and then went to half. So Correct. started out with a quarter. Right. Um, three times a day. And did you take it on an empty stomach or a full stomach? Empty stomach. Seven okay. o'clock in the morning before breakfast, then three o'clock in the afternoon, and then at about 11, just before I went to sleep. Okay. And did you take it with a full glass of water? Generally? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Why did you take it on an empty stomach? Well, I was told the absorption was better. <laughs> And you waited about an hour before you e ate anything? Oh, yes, before yeah. I ate anything. Let it be absorbed. And how high did you, just during that titration period, what was the dose of the medicine that you went up to? A half tablet three times a day. Okay. And what did that do for you? That really has sort of evened me out. I mean, I, I, I still have some symptoms. I still am a little awkward when I walk, but it has improved. Um, I'm not sure whether it's the medication or the therapy, the exercises and the um, the therapy that I received, but definitely more mobile. And I don't walk with my hands in front of me anymore. Is your driving better? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Her driving has always been really good. Yeah. Okay. Well, there was that incident with the post, but we won't go there. <laughs> so tell me, any, any nausea or vomiting with the medication? No. Not at all. No. Did you feel lightheaded or dizzy with the medicine? No. Did you get more sleepy with the medicine? No, not really. No. Okay. And did you and your doctor talk about the long-term implications of starting somebody on levodopa? Yes. And what did what did you talk about? Well, just how long it, it would be effective, and of course that's kind of an unknown, but that it would that it might wear out or the effectiveness wear out. More so that you may require you know, higher dose and require it more yes, frequently, yes, right? Yes, Okay. Did you ever hear about a word called, called dyskinesia? Yes. Or involuntary movements? Yes. Okay. Was that something that you feared uh, and therefore perhaps wanted to delay levodopa? Well, yes. I don't think anyone would like involuntary movements and not want to have them. But, but you know that they don't happen right away. And I'm no. putting... Right? And I particularly asked you where well, you started on a low dose of medicine and then you were tritated slowly to find the right. Right. Thing, right. So as long I, as I did have a little bit in my neck mm -hmm. so that it made it difficult to read the newspaper in the mornings because I was bobbing my neck. 
and so they, they even on a low dose of levodopa mm-hmm. even on half yeah. tablet three times yeah. a day which were functional yes you added uh, or my neurologist added um <laughs> amantadine okay and that uh slowly took care of it i don't have the involuntary neck movement any longer okay very good so you feel like you're functional you're able to do all the things that you enjoy and and yes, you know, yes. and there, there could still be scope for some medication titration and you can talk about that yeah. at your next no, visit. I feel, I feel very sort of comfortable with what. And are you exercising regularly? Yes, every day. What do you do and how many times a week? I do the big program that it was uh, set up by the um, physiotherapists. I believe it was developed by um, a physiotherapist. But uh, I do that every day, every okay. morning. Very good. And you do the speech exercises every day as well? Oh, not every day. I do it about four times a week. Okay. All right. We can maybe have Samantha talk to you more about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay. And, and you said you went go for skin cancer screening. Yes, okay. I do. Okay. Is there anything else about your history, about your condition that we need to, so, uh, that you need to tell us? Not that I can recall, okay. but that's probably part of the cognitive issues. <laughs> And any any of the medical problems besides Parkinson's? Uh, I do have uh, chronic cough, bronchiectasis, so I I deal with that. Do therapy on every day for that. Were you a smoker in the never, past? Never, 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 never smoked. smoked. Okay, how about no one in my family? How about caffeine smoked. intake? Did you drink caffeine? I did. I don't anymore. It doesn't taste very good. Did you drink caffeine for a long period of time? Oh, yes, yeah, thirty years, thirty-five years. Okay, so just to couple more questions about so any history of any repeated head trauma no you know did you ever box or did you ever no. you know fall hit your head none, none of that no did you grow up on a farm no were you ever exposed to any chemicals any insecticides or pesticides and no my father told me the worms tasted the same as the apple <laughs> <laughs> just eat them and no no stroke no history of strokes no, no diabetes hypertension no high cholesterol all that is good no. okay what about family history of Parkinson's or Parkinsonism? That I know of, no one. Nothing in mother, father? No, no mother, father. Know, and, siblings, I did not know anything cousins, beyond that. No. Grandparents? Okay. No. All right. Very good. What about uh, reflux disease? Any, did no. you ever take any medicine called uh, metoclopramide or Regan? No, I've never had an issue. No. None of that. Any, any other things to add? We're going to move on to exam. Okay. So we basically talked about, you know, motor symptoms, we talked about non-motor symptoms, and I tried to explore a little bit about, you know, are there any secondary causes or any atypical symptoms that would suggest to us that this may not be the garden variety Parkinson's disease or could be a secondary form or atypical. So that's our standard, you know, evaluation. Okay, so now we're going to do exam. You ready for that? Yes. Okay, all right. So um, look straight ahead for me. Okay, and say today is a nice day. Today is a nice day. Okay, and smile for us. I am. <laughs> okay, That's very what good. I can do. Now, what I'm going to do is, uh, may I please ask you to take your glasses off, mm-hmm. and you can give it to Mr. Ned. Okay. Now, look straight ahead for me. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold your neck because I don't want you to move it, and I want you to look at my hand. And the pace at which I move my hand, I just want you to follow with your eyes. Okay, is this good distance for you? Correct. Okay, go all the way there range and then go all the way here full range and go all the way up there then go all the way down there okay now what i'm going to do is instead of following you're going to do quick movements all right so i'm going to say look to the right left up or right up up or down okay now quickly without moving your neck look to the left and look straight and look to the right and look straight and look up okay look straight and then look down Okay, I'm going to hold, if you don't mind, I'm just going to hold your eyelids. Don't close your eyes. Okay, now look straight and look down. And look straight and look down. Okay, all right, now close your eyes for me really tight, 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 and open, and tight, 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 and open. Okay, now stick your tongue out to the audience. I'm going to I'm gonna see if you have a tremor. And she seems to have a, stick it out all the way out. That's all the way out. I okay. have a... All right, no, no worries. <laughs> No, no worries. That's good. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put your hands out like that. Okay. Straighten out your fingers. Okay. Up like that. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to touch my finger. And you touch your nose. Finger and nose. 
and finger and no. Good. And do it with the other hand. Finger and no. Finger and no. So, okay. Now put your hands like this. We're gonna close your eyes for me and count loudly backwards from 100. 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95, 94, 93, 92, 91, 90, 89, 88, 87, 86, 85, 84, 83, 82, 81, 80, 79, 78, 76, 77, 76, 75, 74, 73, 72, 71, 70, 69, 68, 67. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to move your neck. Look straight ahead. Tell me if anything hurts. Okay. Put it down. Let me move it. All right. I'm going to move your arm. Again, tell me if anything hurts. Just let me move it, okay? With this hand, I want you to open close for me. Okay. Same thing over. Now open close with the right hand. Good. I'm going to have you pick up your leg up, up like this. Okay. And just relax for me. I'm going to move it all the way up. Now open close with the right hand. Okay. And same thing with the left one. Pick it up. Okay, open close with the left hand. All right. Okay, very good. Just making sure I did the same thing. Okay, now we're gonna have you put your hands like this. Actually, not have one one more thing I want to do. Put your hand like this. Now what are you gonna do is you're gonna tap and go as wide as you can. And then pick up some speed and we're going to do this 10 times. Okay. I'm going to do it with the left hand. Same thing. Okay. Both hands there. Open close. Open close. Open close. Wide open. Make a tight fist. Open wide. Okay. Now keep both hands. Just move your right hand in and out one at a time at the wrist. To the left hand. Okay. Now pick up your right leg and stomp the ground hard. Higher. And the other one. Okay. Very good. Put your hands like this. Now slowly get up. Make sure you're not lightheaded or dizzy. Feel all right? Yep. Yeah. Put your hands on the side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have you go all the way. Till the bar, don't fall, <laughs> and just keep your hands on the side and just walk, walk up and down the. Okay, be very careful. And you can just go back. Yeah, don't go all the way. <laughs> Do not fall. Okay. Right. And do you mind if I do the pull test? Are you gonna be go scared? Ahead. Yeah, no, okay. I'm fine. I'm, I'm not gonna let you fall. Okay. I know. So we do this all the time. So we sprinkle <laughs> nose. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull you back. Okay. You can dig your heels, um, but try to. Take a couple of steps. I will not let you fall. Okay. Initially, mm -hmm. I'm just going to do a very gentle one. Okay. I'm going to do a little harder one. Okay. Good. Have a seat. I almost pull hard enough for them to, to be able to take one step. And when we do this in the clinic, we have a closed door behind. So it's space between <laughs> me and the patient. So nobody really falls. And we all figure out our way to not let them fall. Okay. Um, anything else? Anything we forgot? And I'm going to explain to the audience what we found. No, I think that was. Anything else? Okay. So, and you said 67? I'm sorry? 67? Yeah, it was 68. 68. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, just, birthday, just to summarize, I'm, I'm going to summarize what we found, and I'm going to have Dr. Montgomery comment on it, and then, you know, he'll talk about how we approach this. So, what, what Ms. Brinker told me is she's a 68-year-old woman, and she is more left-handed, but could be ambidextrous. And maybe about five years before she was actually diagnosed that she had the onset of a little twitching of her of her pinky and maybe she was not able to you know move her hand as well and use it for different things but she attributed that to old age and her disease you know just so you guys to understand progressed slowly to the point that now she was not able to do some of her activities of daily living that she needed to do at which point she approached and then she had worsening of the tremor some symptoms going over uh, to the right side, at which point she approached her family doctor, came to see a neurologist, and was diagnosed with a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Uh, what we, what she had, her clinical symptoms were a tremor in her hand, 
and perhaps both hands slowness of movement and some stiffness maybe being a little stooped and walking slowly and my exam reflects that i didn't see did anybody see tremor i thought maybe her thumb was maybe flickered but i didn't really see a resting tremor <laughs> but she also has arthritis so that contributes but you could tell that her movements were small uh, as on slow the left side was affected more than the right so there is the asymmetry she had started on the left side she had slowness of movements with multiple things even opening closing and alternate movements even with the leg taps her left leg was slower she was able to get up without any support but when she walks she is a little stoop and she took small steps but her pull test was was essentially intact and then the other non motor things that i found was maybe some masking of facial expressions perhaps a reduction in speech of uh, in in the sense of smell some low speech volume which thankfully improved after um, after the boys mm -hmm. project and she was able to swallow her vitamin better some constipation that she has she clearly uh, they talked about symptoms of uh, rapid eye movement or rem sleep behavioral disorder uh, but overall is is functional and is doing well one of the important questions to ask ms brinker is tell me when was your last dose of medication it's about 2 o'clock now well i was told not to take any today <laughs> So, so when, when was it? Seven o'clock in the morning. But okay. the last one was uh, eleven o'clock last night. So her, this is very critical to know because you know uh, she, her last dose of medicine was at eleven p.m. last night, and it's about twelve plus two, so the three, mm -hmm. about uh, fifteen hours, and she's doing reasonably well. But you know, clearly she is very symptomatic, and once she takes her dopamine, how long does it take for your dopamine to act? act? Mm, half an hour. Half an hour. Okay. So we'll, we'll have to talk about that and we'll have to figure out whether what she is taking is, you know, but clearly she's a very educated patient. I know because she's my patient as well. Uh, but she takes the medicines the right way and she does all the right things and exercises. So seems like, you know, we'll have to talk about some medication adjustments at your next mm -hmm. visit. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. I'll turn it over to Dr. Montgomery for... Yeah, um, just a couple of things I might I might mention. Um, the issue of depression. Depression is very common in Parkinson's disease, and in fact, it's part of the disease itself. The changes that go on in the brain that cause tremor and slowness of movement also can cause depression. In fact, a number of years ago, we did it, developed a battery of tests to predict who would get Parkinson's disease, and so there were a number of components of that test battery. That was very useful in predicting who was going to get Parkinson's disease. And depression, mild, mild depression, was a sign of early Parkinsonism. And we know from talking to Parkinson patients that many of them will have depression before they actually develop the tremor or the slowness of movement. My point being is it's very much part of the disease. It's something that needs to be recognized because the, tr the depression can be treated very, very readily uh, in Parkinson's disease. So. To me, the great tragedy of depression in Parkinson's disease is when it goes unrecognized and untreated. Also, just want to mention something about driving because that's a huge issue for patients. It's a huge issue for everybody. You know, in the United States, uh, you know, you don't have a car. You you have you don't have much of a quality of life. And and I think in Texas, they must be partial to their cars because I see these huge cars. <laughs> I think they're called trucks. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are very partial to to your automobiles. And and so some patients will be very concerned that they'll lose their ability to drive the car. That's not necessarily true. Okay? So we have many patients who can still drive but they have to drive in certain circumstances or certain with certain adaptive devices. So a patient as you see with Parkinson's disease very slow we train them to allow greater stopping distance. We train them to anticipate things so that they, can, they don't have to re, uh, rely on their slowed reaction times and able to manage that. So whenever I have a, any patient or a, particularly a family member or caregiver raises any concerns about driving, first thing I do is I reassure the patient that that does not necessarily mean they can't drive, maybe just the circumstances in which they drive has to be altered. And I refer the patients to either a physical therapist or an occupational therapist who can then do driving evaluations. And as I say, uh, it's not a matter of can you drive or not. Maybe you can drive, but you just have to do certain things to make the driving safer for everybody. 
Um, I have some patients, though, that I ask, I give them my cell phone, and I say, anytime you go out in your car, please call me so I can get off the road. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I think that's pretty much it. I can let you go ahead with the... I'm sorry? Uh, go ahead with the rest of your talk. Oh, okay. Yep. yep. So I guess now we're going to queue up uh, my uh, brief presentation. And if you're more comfortable sitting down in the audience, you're more than welcome to. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to step out here where I can take a quick look at the, the slide there and, and reference myself. Um, you know, there's a saying, you can stop an Italian by talking. You can st stop an Italian from talking by tying their hands, right? And I, I'm Italian. I'm an example of that. But I'm also a professor, so if you want to quiet a professor, take away their slides. <laughs> So I just allow me to uh, introduce myself. I am the medical director of the Greenville Neuromodulation Center in Greenville, Pennsylvania. However, I'm currently living in Ontario, Canada. So I'm working half time and much of my work I can do through the internet. So for example, I assist in deep brain stimulation surgery. So prior to implanting the permanent electrode, we use a temporary electrode to record brain cell activity. And by just listening to how these nerve cells fire, I can figure out where we are in the brain and where we need to be. So I can say, okay, this is a good place to put the permanent electrode, or I can say, nope, this is not a good place, let's go over here, let's go over there. So I'm in the enviable position. Everybody in the operating room envies me, because I can tell the surgeon where to go. <laughs> I do that carefully because he has, and she has, all sorts of sharp objects that they can throw at me. So I've been... Uh, involved in Parkinson's disease now for over 40 years. Much of my work has been in trying to understand how the brain controls movement and what happens in patients with Parkinson's disease. So I would do research in monkeys as they play video games. I would record brain, brain cell activity and then we would make the monkeys Parkinsonian and we'd go back and try to figure out what goes wrong. Then with the development of deep brain stimulation, I shifted much of my research to the operating room. So this way when we're recording brain cell and activity in the operating room, I could have patients do video games and things like that in the operating room to see how their brain is involved in controlling movement. And that actually turns out uh, really well because monkeys, you have to pay them to, do, to play the video games. So we give them rewards in order to then play video games. Patients, I can get them to do it for nothing. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, kind of our approach to the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But I, a number of caveats and, and, a, and a plea. Uh, my niece is in the audience. She is 10 times smarter than me. So please, no tough question. So just kidding. No, she is really 10 times smarter than me. Um, the other thing is that uh, I make no claims to spell anything right. So I, I no claims for spelling words right on the slide. I have terrible dyslexia. In fact, when I was a third-year medical student on my pediatric rotation, the resident said, you're going into neurology, aren't you? I said, that's uncanny. How did you know that? He said, in your entire write-up, the only word you spelled correctly was dysdidocokinesia, which is a <laughs> neurological term. So, with, with, uh, um, so I, I de again, apologize ahead of time if there's anything uh, misspelled. So we're going to talk about the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And what I hope to show you is that this is not a simple thing. The diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is complicated and difficult. And also there are different types of diagnoses. There are different diagnoses that we make depending on what we need to do. Okay. So I'm going to say that if we're going to think about this kind of treatment, we, make one, we have one set of diagnoses. If we're going to try this treatment, we're going to have a different kind of diagnosis. This is a complicated concept. It's a difficult one. Uh, even for doctors and healthcare professionals. So, as you know, Parkinson's disease was first described by James Parkinson in 1817 in his essay on the shaking palsy, and it's based on his observations of three individual patients. And he uh, still today provides one of the best descriptions of patients with Parkinson's disease that you'll find. And so, 
He's the one who originally described this illness, and he based this on the signs and symptoms that he saw of the patient. So just observing them, he noticed the tremor, he noticed the stooped posture, he noticed the slowed movement, he noticed the pot potential the propensity to propel their gait forward. So he noticed all these things. And even today, the criteria that he discovered, the things that he discovered, we still use to make our diagnoses. Which means then there is no test now, no MRI scan, no blood test, no x-ray, no DAT scan that tells us that a patient has Parkinson's disease. So it's still very, very dependent on what the doctor sees when he or she examines the patient and talks to the patient. And, and that creates, uh, creates some difficulties. Okay? Now, there's a lot of research being done trying to develop tests to help with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But as I will show you, that is a very, very difficult thing to do. And it's primarily very difficult because there are a relatively few number of patients with Parkinson's disease in the community. And whenever that happens, it makes the statistical analysis, the mathematical analysis, very difficult. If I can have the next slide. Okay. So, James Parkinson's, his essay on the shaking palsy. It was actually Charcot, who was a neurologist at the French hospital, uh, the Salpetriere, who actually coined the term Parkinson's disease in honor of James Parkinson. And he actually had medications at the time to treat those patients. He used an extract of the belladonna plant. And now we still use those same kinds of medications today with the anticholinergics like artane, cogentin, and amantadine. All of these share very similar properties that the belladonna plant did back in the late 1800s. Next slide. So one of the remarkable things that happened with uh, Parkinson's disease and our ability to study and understand it was the development of what we call animal models. And one of the first animal models was developed in the 1950s in which a blood pressure medicine was administered to rats. And it slowed these rats down. The rats looked like they developed Parkinson's disease, which was astonishing. What's, what's more astonishing to me is that a, a researcher playing around with rats had the presence of mind to say, oh, that looks like a Parkinsonian rat. Okay? So when they gave the rats par Parkinsonism using this drug called reserpine, they then took the brain, ground it up, uh, and measured the amount of dopamine, a neurochemical in the brain, a neurotransmitter in the brain, and found that it was diminished. They, oh, okay, a reduction of dopamine. Let's give dopamine and get the rat better. Well, the problem is you can't give dopamine because it doesn't get into the brain. So you give levodopa. Levodopa gets into the brain, converted to dopamine, and that's what helped these rats. And so then they took that drug, and they gave it to uh, humans with Parkinson's disease with remarkable benefit. Another huge breakthrough in Parkinson's disease research, which translated to much better treatment, was the discovery of another animal model of Parkinson's disease. And this is using a drug called MPTP. So in the 1980s, there was this drug discovered that produced Parkinsonism. And for those of you taking notes, MPTP is short for n methyl 4 phenyl one 2 3 6 tetrahydroxyperidine Don't ask me how to spell it. And so this drug actually was produced Parkinsonism in humans first. And then they said, oh, let's try and take that drug and see if it can produce Parkinsonism in laboratory animals. They gave it to rats. Rats didn't care. They gave it to mice. Mice, and they were about to abandon it when a group of researchers at the NIH then gave that same drug to monkeys. And they produced um, Parkinsonism in these monkeys, and that has just opened up the floodgates in terms of research. I, can, I dare tell, can say now that much of our progress in therapies for Parkinson's disease is owed directly to the development of these animal models, particularly the MPTP. Why am I saying all this? Because Animal research is under threat, and there is a possibility that it that these things could be taken tools could be taken away from us, in which case then I worry about them where the next generation of treatments will come from. So that's why I wanted to be sure to bring this out. Uh, next slide. So, levodopa miracle drug, miracle drug. I I recommend if anybody hasn't seen this movie 
uh, Awakenings. If you've not seen Awakenings, it is a wonderful, wonderful movement. Now, it's important to note that these patients that were in the movie Awakenings did not have the usual form of Parkinson's disease. They had what was called post-encephalitic Parkinson's disease, which is a consequence of a viral infection in the brain. So what happened with these people is not what we see for Parkinson patients now. And, you know, we can do so, so much better. But it is a remarkable movie in so many ways. And it just shows the dramatic effect then that levodopa had. Uh, it, it's, but it's, it's a remarkable move, movie on, on so many levels. And I encourage you to, to watch that movie. Uh, we have the slide again? Okay. So at first, though, levodopa was a failure. They would give it to all sorts of patients. And, you know, it's a, it's a thing about rat research. You know, uh, it, the saying in medicine is we can cure cancer. Easily. It's easy to cure cancer. We've done it 10,000 times in rats. It's when you try to do it in humans that it becomes a different ball game. So they gave levodopa to humans and no benefit until the late 1960s when a uh, neurologist named George Kotsius then said, well, let's just keep giving more and more of it. So he would then give them, by those standards, massive doses of levodopa. And lo and behold, the patients got better. And so it was just an absolute miracle drug. It, there's no question, patients who had been confined to wheelchairs or beds were given levodopa, and they were able to get up out of the chair and be almost normal. It was amazing. In fact, there was a lot of concerns about um, levodopa being too good. And there were letters written to the editors of various journals concerned about the aphrodisiac qualities of levodopa because old men were getting up and chasing nurses all over the floors. Okay, so a remarkable benefit. Next slide. Okay, so there, with all this remarkable research on dopamine, on levodopa, there was, became this tendency to think about Parkinson's disease as a deficiency of levodopa or a deficiency of dopamine. And that's not true. There are many forms of Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism that are not necessarily associated with a loss of dopamine. So we have to start to rethink that. And why is, why is that important? Because if you think that Parkinson's disease is just a deficiency of dopamine, then you try to develop tests to, to determine if there's dopamine loss in the brain. Well, that can lead you astray if you're dealing with a patient who doesn't have that form of Parkinson's. So it raises real questions about how do we define Parkinson's and from that, what kind of things do we use to make the diagnosis? Next slide. So it makes a big difference then. And so we know today there's no x-ray test, no laboratory test, no scan that tells us whether a patient has Parkinson's disease. So what do we have to do? We have to rely on the physician. We have to rely on their acumen, their sensibilities, their skills, their experience. And that because and they have to uh, make the diagnosis. And very importantly, most the physician that doc, uh, patients see most commonly are the primary care physicians, the family doctor. So they're the critical linchpin then in the diagnosis getting made. So how well are they doing? Well, if you go to a community, and this has been done on several communities, you knock on the door. You find every patient in the community that has Parkinson's disease, right? 28% of them have not been diagnosed. 28%. This is a big, big problem because we now know that we have medications that can slow the progress of the disease. So it's very, very important to find these patients and to find them early so that we can try to slow their disease. And maybe one day we'll have drugs to prevent the disease. We also know that if you take 100 patients that have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, 25% of them have been misdiagnosed. So there is huge problems then in terms of diagnosis. Next slide. So again, it's very important then that we recognize the disease as early as we possibly can, because we may have then treatments that can really slow the progression. Okay. We did a survey of our Parkinson community in Tucson, Arizona, when I was at the University of Arizona. And it was very disturbing. Over half the patients had, had to wait two years before they were given the accurate diagnosis. So these are, are serious issues. Next slide. So what are some of the obstacles then? Why do we have so much trouble making the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease? And there's a saying, one sees what one is prepared to see. 
if a physician is not prepared mentally to think about or be suspicious about Parkinson's disease, they're not likely to make the diagnosis. And this is, as I mentioned, particularly important in the primary care physician because they are the gatekeepers then most of the time for uh, referral to movement disorders, neurologists. Next slide. Okay. So what is their preparation then to make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease? Well, most medical students get one hour of lecture on Parkinson's disease in the four years of medical education. I submit to you that's not nearly enough to be able to make the diagnosis. They go on to do their internship and residency. They may never see another Parkinson patient again. And, and so these are, are real, real problems then for educating and training then the frontline physicians that we need to depend on to make the diagnosis. Next, next slide. There are some physicians that think that you have to have tremor to make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Well, that's not true. 30 to, 30 to 40 percent of patients with Parkinson's disease do not have tremor. Or, as in our young lady this evening, just a little tremor in the finger that easily could have gone unnoticed. Another big problem is that doctors think that Parkinson's disease is only a disease of the elderly. And again, we know that's not true. We know that about 10% of patients with Parkinson's disease were diagnosed before age 40. And the youngest person I've seen that probably has Parkinson's disease was 17. So it's not a disease just of the elderly. Next slide. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, there are a variety of ways to make the diagnosis. One is what we call the pathological diagnosis. And that is being able to take a piece of the brain and look at it under the microscope and look for microscopic changes that tells us what kind of Parkinson's we're dealing with. And there's some very nice studies out of England that if you take 100 patients who were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, 73% of the time they have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. That's the most common garden, garden variety type Parkinson's. If you had to have Parkinson's, that's the one to have because that's the one that responds best to medication. By the way, idiopathic means we don't know Parkinson's disease. Okay? So idio means you don't know. Pathic means what causes it. So the most common form of Parkinson's disease is we're too dumb to, make, to know what causes it, Parkinson's disease. That means about 27% of the time it's something else like uh, a multi-system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, a buildup of fluid inside the brain we call normal pressure hydrocephalus, or sometimes it can be due to stroke. And so you heard Dr. Chitnas ask a lot of questions related to blood pressures and medications, trying to assess the risk for stroke, because you're always concerned, could this particular person, Parkinson's disease, be due to stroke? Next slide. Okay. But the pathological diagnosis is not terribly helpful, right? I mean, you have a patient come in and says, oh, yeah, I think you might have Parkinson's disease. Let's take out a piece of your brain and tell. Yeah, that's not, that's not going to go over too far. Okay. So we have to develop other types of means that help us to predict what we might actually see should we ever have the opportunity to actually look at the brain under a microscope. And this has really, I think, in many ways, has skewed our thinking about how to make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Next slide. So there are many different kinds of Parkinson's disease. I will submit to you there are many different kinds of Parkinson's disease. And what creates the different kinds of Parkinson's disease is what are you going to do once you have the diagnosis, okay? Unfortunately, among physicians, and particularly neurologists, there is this tendency to want to make the diagnosis for, because it's interesting from a scientific perspective or interesting from a medical perspective. And I, I admit to being guilty of that at times. But critically, critically, the diagnosis depends on what are you going to do once you have the diagnosis. And I'm going to show you how that makes, makes a difference. Next slide. Whenever we do any tests, there's always a trade-off, okay? Now, there's a tendency to think laboratory tests, um, like companies like Beckman Coulter make these beautiful, expensive, did I say expensive? I mean, expensive machines to do these tests. And when they come out and says, this test means Parkinson's disease, it's gospel. No, okay? No test is 100% accurate. No test is 100% specific. 
And so we have to, we have to in, think about that. Doctors have to think about it. I'm going to order a test. I want to know how accurate that test is. I want to know how much I can depend on that test. And there are two particular issues that we're concerned. We're concerned is how often in a patient with Parkinson's disease will the test be abnormal? Okay, and that's what we call our, specific, our sensitivity. So if I have 100 patients with Parkinson's disease, I do a test that's abnormal in 99%, that could be a good test. But if I, have a, if I do a test for Parkinson's disease and it's only good 80% of the time, yeah, you know, what are you going to do with the other 20%? On the same token, I want a test that if a person doesn't have Parkinson's disease, it's going to be a negative test. Okay, And if I have a test that's 97% specific, that means three times out of 100, someone who's actually normal, I'll misdiagnose as having Parkinson's disease. So you see, whenever we think about tests, we have to think about how accurate are these tests. And it's also not a matter of how are accurate these tests are, but it also depends on what kind of patients I'm doing this test on, okay? What we call the prior probabilities. What is the, what is the chance of a person just out of the blue having Parkinson's disease? Because that affects how, we, how, how well the tests are going to be predicted. So what we're interested in is how many true positives do we have, patients with Parkinson's disease? How many false positives do we have? How many normal people were misdiagnosed as having Parkinson's disease? How many true negatives do we have? People that don't have Parkinson's disease and the test is negative. How many false negatives do we have? How many people with Parkinson's disease that we miss the diagnosis that we think they're normal? So these are the critical factors that surround the test. That's why DAT scans, the radio, a radioisotope study of the brain, is a terrible test. Because it's predicted, has too many false positives and too many false negatives in most cases. So rarely do we use that test. Same thing for MRI scan. Very high rate of false positives. So again, the, these tests are, are not very helpful. Next, next slide. Okay, so we talked about what specificity is. We talked about sensitivity. These are measures any good clinician, any good physician, before they order the test, the first thing they have to ask themselves, what is the sensitivity of this test? What is the specificity of this test? And what is the population like that I'm going to apply these tests to? Next slide. Okay. So, for example, let's say you have a test that's 97% accurate. 97% of normal people are going to have a negative test. 97% of people with Parkinson's disease are going to have a positive test. Good test, eh? No. Okay, you could have a situation, say a patient, a group of patients over the age 65, you do the test. Well, sure enough, you'll find three out of 100 that have Parkinson's disease. But at the same time, you're going to diagnose three people as having Parkinson's disease. Okay, so that's where it gets, that gets where, where it gets dicey. Next slide. So uh, I, I covered this one. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so it depends on the circumstances. It's, it's going to depend on what the consequences are. Okay, so for example, there are drugs like levodopa, primapixol, rupinerol. These are drugs used to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Okay, so you don't want, and they're pretty effective, and you don't want to deny patients with Parkinson's disease that those medications. Okay, but it, so we, so we have our criteria is going to be fairly loose because. If we wind up treating a normal person with these drugs, it's not such a big deal. So we'd much rather treat normal people who have been mistakenly diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. We'd much rather treat them with medications than to miss the ones that do have Parkinson's disease and then they don't get the medication. So you see, in this circumstance, we're going to be kind of loose a little bit with our criteria because we have we made this value judgment. Better to falsely treat three normals than to mistreating three patients, not treating three patients with Parkinson's disease. Next slide. But we also, but the situation changes if we're thinking about using drugs to slow the progression of the disease. So for example, there's a drug called Selegiline. And this drug, in my opinion, does help to slow the progression of the disease. And so, you know, if you even suspect somebody has Parkinson's disease, you're going to want to use this drug. Okay. 
Perhaps. But in one study where 200 individuals were given selegiline and 200 individuals were giving sugar pills, there were more complaints of side effects on the sugar pills than there were on the selegiline. So you can see selegiline is very well tolerated. So if a patient walks in the door, if I even smell that they may have Parkinson's disease, I'm, I'm likely to recommend that medication just to hedge our bets because the downside of it is so little and the upside is so great if we can slow the progression of the disease. Okay, so you see, here's a circumstance. In fact, you know, an argument could be made to put selegiline in the drinking water, okay, to slow the progression of the disease. Well, I, and, and we do this all the time anyway. So, for example, if you use iodinated table salt, you're being treated for goiter. Whether you know it or not, you're being treated for goiter. The downside of adding sodium iodide to table salt is so minimal that even if it only treats one in a million patients with goiter, it's still worth it, okay? Anytime you drink vitamin-enriched, vitamin D-enriched milk or vitamin-enriched enriched bread, you are being treated for rickets, even though the chances of having rickets are extraordinarily low. So you see, this is the, making the diagnosis depends on what you're going to do. What are the consequences? In fact, in the case of goiter and iodinated table salt and rickets and vitamin D-enriched foods, you don't even bother testing. Next slide. But now when we come to deep brain stimulation, it's a different ballgame because we know that deep brain stimulation does not help these other forms of Parkinson's disease. And in fact, deep brain stimulation can make these other forms of Parkinson's disease worse. So now our criteria is going to be a lot tighter, isn't it? Because the last thing we want to do is, is subject a patient who has an atypical form of Parkinson's disease, the last thing we want to do is subject them to the risks of the surgery for no potential benefit. So in that case, then, well, you know, we would just as soon not put a DBS in somebody with a regular Parkinson's disease than to risk putting it in someone who doesn't have Parkinson's disease. So you see, the whole idea about the criteria, the diagnosis, depends on what you're going to do with the diagnosis. Next slide. So it's also true for genetic disorders. There are now, oh gosh, a whole bunch of different genetic abnormalities that have been identified as having Parkinson's disease. So it is possible then to do genetic tests. Now, genetic tests are complicated and they're fraught with all sorts of difficulties in terms of confidentiality, whether it does having a genetic abnormality, is that a pre-existing condition that can get you knocked out of health insurance or life insurance? These are big, big downsides to doing genetic testing. But what's the upside? Well, there's probably really no upside. It's not going to change how you treat the patient. And, you, and you, it's not like you're going to tell the patient's children or grandchildren not to have children. We just don't know enough about the genetics and what that means. So um, as part of due diligence, as part of my responsibility to patients, I always discuss the possibility of genetic tests. But it's pretty clear from my discussion that I see very little upside to do it and a great deal of downside in doing that. That's fine. So again, we do we our our criteria, our, the ways we diagnose Parkinson's di di disease depends on what we're going to do do with that diagnosis for the patient's sake. Okay. So what are we what does making a diagnosis mean for what's going to happen to the patient? That what guides us. And there are different things that we can do, and that generates then different types of diagnoses. Uh, next slide. I think that, okay. That, that, that. So those are some of the comments I wanted to make about um, the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. You can see it's quite complicated. You know, it's been amazing. I've been specializing in Parkinson's disease now for 40 years, and the advances in so many ways are breathtaking. What we can do for patients today is just amazing. But still, in terms of diagnosis, we're right still where we are in 1817. Okay. And and you know, I'm hoping that that the next next 10 years we'll be able to do a lot better in that regard. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And oh, but thank you all very, very much. And I want to thank the uh, the people that invited me and Dr. Chitness uh, to, to invite me here to speak. I, I just want to make a little uh, comment. 
this sort of program is extremely important, extremely important. And I was made aware of this quite a number of years ago when I was giving a talk to a lay audience. And I told the audience, I said, Parkinson's disease is not contagious. You can hug a Parkinson patient and not worry about getting Parkinson's disease. In fact, I recommend hugging a Parkinson patient. And then a gentleman the way in the back raised his hand. He says, well, Dr. Montgomery, you're wrong. Parkinson's disease is contagious. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, since I got Parkinson's disease, everybody around me is going deaf. <laughs> okay. So I, the, the ability to communicate, the ability to communicate your feelings, your desires, your hopes, your wishes for others, that's such an integral part of one's life. And in fact, the impairment of speech is probably one of the biggest factors in destroying a person's quality of life. So programs like this are, are very, very important. They're solely needed, and we need more of them. So again, thank you all very much. We, thank you, Dr. Montgomery, Dr. Chitness. I think we have time just for a couple questions. Anybody have a question for the doctor? Oh, okay. He spoke with intent, so he gets one. Uh, on an early slide, you uh, gave us 79% uh, are caused by, uh, Parkinson's cases are caused by lack of dopamine. So that raises the question, which I don't think you addressed, what the other 20% are caused by. And presumably those 21% that are not caused by lack of dopamine don't want to take carbidopa levidopa, and therefore that will not be the right medication. What might be the right medication for those 21%? Right. So exactly. Um, with, with the development of, uh, for, for example, the rodent model of Park, uh, Parkinson's where they gave reserpine and showed the dopamine was depleted. A few years later then, there was some pathologists that discovered that in most cases of idiopathic Parkinson's disease, there was degeneration of this part of the brain called the substantia nigra. And it was later found out that the neurons in this part of the brain, uh, the substantia nigra neurons, created dopamine. So there was like this laser focus on the subthalamic nucleus. And everything is direct. Even today, everybody's thinking is directed at the subthalamic nucleus. What people don't realize, what scientists don't realize, is that the subthalamic, I'm sorry, the substantia nigra is part of a large network, okay? And you can produce the same kinds of disabilities by putting a, a problem anywhere in that network, okay? So uh, if a car just doesn't run, there are many, many places where you could damage the car so it doesn't run. It's foolish to think that it's only at the battery, okay? And so that has been a huge problem in, in biomedical research and in neurology. It's just this laser-like focus on the substantia nigra and nowhere else. We know that that's not true. So before we had this drug MPTP to produce Parkinsonism in laboratory animals, we, did, we produced Parkinsonism in laboratory animals by exposing them to carbon monoxide and carbon disulfide. And that would then produce strokes in a part of the brain called the globus pallidus. And so these animals were clearly Parkinsonian. And as Dr. Chitness mentioned, if a person, if a human has strokes in this part of the brain, they'll have Parkinson's as well. So you see, we're, we've been working very hard over the years to get doctors to think not at the substantia nigra, but the entire network. And so that opens up a better understanding of the things that can cause disease, but it also opens up a lot of opportunities for different types of therapy. So instead of focusing our therapeutic de uh, development efforts on the substantia nigra, we can now focus our therapeutic e interest efforts in other parts of the system. So um, it's a systems disorder. There are multiple pathologies that can affect that system. We need to think about it as a system. Is there, oh, here. Does that mean the answer to my question is you don't know? No, well, no, 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 no. Okay, so what, in one, and for one, re, one part we don't know because there's never been a systematic study of levodopa in patients who had strokes of the globus pallidus. That I can tell you. But in laboratory animals, you give levodopa and it can help these animals. The key is that, again, it's a system. And we could have pathology in a system, but we can try to fix it down here with levodopa. 
Okay, so we can, we have to avoid this kind of um, kind of uh, one one dimensional kind of thinking. So, person could have Parkinson's disease without damage to the sub, sub, substantia nigra pars compacta, yet still may benefit from levodopa. So that still is a possibility. There's nothing incompatible or inconsistent about that. You mentioned in one of your slides that DBS was the best treatment for idiopathic Parkinson's. At what point would you consider DBS for a patient with Parkinson's? Okay. Uh, did I have that in my slide? If I did, but that's a yes. cool, it's, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> okay. Yes, you did. And this small part. <laughs> You're absolutely right. DBS is the most effective treatment for Parkinson's disease. There are now very good studies that prove that. So if you take a group of a whole bunch of patients, half of them get the brain stimulation, half of them get the best treatment by the best movement disorders neurologist. After two years, the ones that get the DBS are doing the best. There's no question about it. The problem is that there are significant surgical risks. So there's about a two to three chance out of 100 of a serious or permanent complication. There is about a one out of 2,000 chance of actual death. Okay, so for those reasons, we still emphasize medication. The last thing we want is for somebody to go into the operating room and has, you know, be one of the unfortunate two out of a hundred that has a serious complication, and then we all hate ourselves because we didn't try this medicine or that medicine. Okay, so there's no question that DBS is the most effective, but in the because of the issues of surgical risk, we have to mock, you know, we have to put that in the proper context. And, there are several criteria. First and foremost criteria is what kind of Parkinson's do they have? You don't want to put DBS in a patient that has atypical Parkinsonism. So the first thing you want to know is do they have idiopathic Parkinson's disease? Because of the surgical risks, you want to make sure that you've exhausted all other reasonable options before going to the DBS. The next thing is that they need to be willing to uh, accept the risks of that surgery. Basically, I tell patients that if you don't have a quality of life that you want and you've had a reasonable attempt at medications and everybody's pretty confident that this is idiopathic Parkinson's disease, you should definitely consider DBS. Now, that's not the same as saying that you should have DBS, but you should certainly consider it. And if you're going to consider DBS, you need to discuss it with a physician, a movement disorder specialist like Dr. Chitnis. You need to discuss it with somebody who knows a lot about DBS. There are a lot of neurologists out there that are offering very bad advice about DBS. Okay, I'm sorry, we're out of, ten, uh, out of time. Uh, Dr. Chitness and Dr. Montgomery might have about 10 minutes up here, but then they have to leave. Um, I want to mention that today's lecture was sponsored by Alan and Lynn Wagner, so I want to thank them for that. We will have a lecture on the second Saturday of every month, one at 10.30, one at 1.30, and the 10.30 one will be streamed live on Facebook. It worked this morning. We're so excited. And then the Monday following the lecture, so this Monday, the 10.30 lecture, we have a video recording. It will be on our website, so you can refer family and friends to it. And on Monday, we will open up reservations for our next lecture, which will be in May, which will be a, a speech language pathologist, a professor from Lehman College in New York, talking about the basal ganglia. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend.